let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles or your cellular devices. One thing I don't like about cell phones is uh, the Bible. And then that Snapchat icon or that Instagram icon comes on. It's really, really hard not to click on that thing. So I like the good old, good old fashioned book. But um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. God bless you. Uh, very happy to have you here. For the rest of us here, uh, every week, for the rest of us here who are here every week, uh, love seeing you guys. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me preach here from here time to time. When our Pastor David's not here, and um, we are currently in a series about obedience. And um, just to preface what I'm about to say today, Pastor David did not ask me to preach this sermon. Um, he actually told me you could preach whatever you wanted, nor did he hint at any need uh, for me to preach this sermon. But today I do want to speak on the subject of obeying your leaders, obeying your leaders. And that would include someone like uh, Pastor David. So would you look to your neighbor and say, obey your leaders? Obey your <clears throat> look to the other neighbor you like less and say, obey your leaders. And if you, didn't do, if you didn't do it because you are a disobedient sort of person, then look to someone and say, I will obey my leaders. Obey my leaders. Amen. All right. Uh, yeah, let me read the passage. Let's pray together and, and let's get right into it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says this. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Come on, somebody. Okay, let me read that one more time. That's so good. All right. That feels good to read as a pastor. Okay. <laughs> let's read, let's read, let me read it one more time, okay? Because every word is important. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. <coughs> Loving, gracious Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our great shepherd. That you lead us, that you shepherd us, guide us through the valleys, through the mountains, through the hills through the green pastures. Lord Jesus, you are leading us. And Lord, I believe you're speaking to us today, Lord, through this word, through your spirit. And you want to do something in the hearts and the lives of your people at, here at Emmanuel Church. So, so Father, we welcome your presence. Lord, I pray that you would increase faith and expectation in our hearts to hear from you. And to have you work on us, Father, we're all work uh, projects uh, still in works as you form us and conform us to the image of your Son. So, Father, have your way. Do your thing, God. We love you. We invite you. We want to listen to you. And we bless you because you first blessed us. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, allow me to say this, maybe not as an introductory remark, but as just a side note um, before I even start anything. Um, I know that religious people, which is probably most of you here, religious people are good at following rules. And we're good at following shoulds. And we're really good at, I should do this, and I should do that, and I fell short at this, and I should be doing this, I should be praying more, I should be reading the Bible, I should be loving God, I should be evangelizing. We're really good at being driven by the shoulds, by the precepts and the principles of this life. And whether that's biblical or, or, or just because you want to be a better, better person, because you're just, you grew up in the church, or you just tend to be a little more religious or a little more spiritual or, or a little more oriented on bettering yourself, etc. We're really driven by shoulds and precepts and principles. And, and when I look around and, and I pray for you, that's, that's the kind of religion I feel in this room for a lot of us. Not all of us, but a lot of us. We're really driven by the principles and the precepts. But I want to challenge you. Because Christianity, the joy of Christianity and the power of Christianity comes from when you're not driven by principles and precepts, but by a person. 
when you begin to engage Jesus, not as a principle, you should, you should, you should, or a precept, you must, you must, you must, but as a person, a living God, when you begin to relate with him in this romantic, true, real way, when he becomes your God and not just a bunch of rules and regulations, that's why the Bible says that you've been freed from the law and you've, been, you've entered the realm of grace. And in the realm of grace, we're not just dealing with principles and precepts. You should, you should, you should. I'm falling short in this and that. But you're in a relationship with a person, a personal God, Jesus, who loves you, who is your strength, who is your joy, who wants to empower you, who will bring a brand new meaning to what joy means, what religion means, what walking with God means, not just obeying a bunch of rules, but living in that power and grace that He has for you because He is a living and personal God. Can I get an amen? That's, what, that's the power of Christianity. It really is. A lot of us walk in here after a week long you know, of working at Wherever you guys work at, going to school, and, and, you know, a lot of our religion is, I should, I should, I should. And then we come on Sundays, and it's almost like a re-guilt trip, you know. Oh, I should be doing this. I should be loving God more. I should be putting him up in the front. You know, the praise leader goes up there, and he begins to sing, and he says something along the lines of, you know, God, we know that we should be loving you. We fall short. The preacher comes up here, and the preacher says, these are the ways we fall short. you got to do all this better. And it becomes really... This, this, this super like guilt trip, I lived a bad week, got to come back here, I got beat up, I got to get this right, what are the rules I need to follow again? Oh yeah, that's right, I need to go back out there. And, and it becomes sort of this drudgery, it becomes um, just dry and empty and about principles and morality. And, and, and I only have a short time here, and I, like I said, it's an introductory statement, but I want to challenge you to... Look at Christianity as God presents it to you, which is a relationship with a person. It's the most romantic thing. It's the most wonderful thing. It could be the most real thing. Not just, I, I got to do these things, and when I fall short, I got to feel bad, and I really got to do better. But, man, that love relationship with Jesus, that personal relationship, especially for those of you who really grew up in the church, and church has become principles and precepts and rules and regulations. I want to invite you. God invites you to a relationship with himself, a living God, the person of Jesus. And that's what I believe Christianity is all about. That's why I think Christians should be and could be the most joyful, the most free, the most empowered people on this planet because their significance comes not from achieving something but being loved by someone. And that someone is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Man, the power of Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ. Just to throw out there, for those of you for whom this is just another religious Sunday, man, let's break out of it. Break into what is a tremendous, tremendous truth, the relationship with Jesus. Now, having said all that, let's, let's dive into today's sermon. Um, how many of you here are, uh, if I'm honest, you're, you, if you are honest, you're the type of person, if you hear a rule, like, you feel obligated to obey it. Like, you're, you're very highly principled. You're like, you hear a rule, like, we should follow that rule. Like, it just makes sense to follow that rule. Anybody? Like, fences are there for a reason. Okay. How many of you here are the type of people you hear a rule and you want to break the rule? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're the rebellious. I'm, I'm like that. If my wife says, go right, then I go left on purpose. And I go, I look at her, I go, I can go left if I want. You know? <laughs> so, uh, that, that's, that's the type of person I am. That's the type of person I'm sure some of you are in, the, in this room. Today I want to talk about submission, obedience to leaders. We're in, this, we're in the subject of obedience at our church. And um, man, I, I, I chose this and I was praying for us and I chose this because I don't know if Pastor David is going to come up here and say, I want you all to obey me. And I want you to submit to the leadership of this church. He might say that about the deacons, but pastors have a hard time coming up here and say, listen to me. You know, So you know what, I'm going to do it for him. Uh, he's on vacation, so, so I'm going to do it for him. Let me read the verse one more time because it's so good. And actually, even as I read it, I want to go back to the youth room right now and yell at all the kids and say, look what it says. Okay? So, so. It says this, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that will be of no advantage to you. Um, so I just want to break this text down in th three simple ways. Whom we obey, why we obey, how we obey, whom we obey, why we obey, and how we obey. 
So let's just take it from the top. It says this, obey your leaders. Can you all say leaders? Obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them. You know, it's, we don't know who wrote the book Hebrews. Many people say it's Paul. Some people say it's uh, Barnabas. Some people say it's Apollos. We don't know. But one thing I know about the scripture is this. If, and, and for many preachers, you'll hear us doing this too. We say the same thing using different verbiage. Because we're trying to hit the same point in different ways so people really, really understand it. So people really, really come to grasp it. So people really, really get it down in their hearts. You know, you see, I just did that. You know, understand, grasp, get it down in their hearts. I just said the same thing in three different ways. And, and on top of verse 17, it says, obey and submit. Two words means the same thing. Um, obedience is a common word. Uh, it means to obey. It means to listen. It means to do what that person says. Submit is a rare word in Greek. It's only found in this text throughout the entirety of Scripture. It means to give deference to. It means to say, okay, I'm going to do what you say. Uh, you, you said something. I think another thing, but I'm going to de give deference to what you are saying. I'm going to defer to your opinion and your thought. And the first point, whom we obey, it says this, obey your Leaders. Can you say leaders one more time? Leaders. leaders. Now, how many people in this church are considered leaders? Could you raise your hand? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, deacons, y'all should be raising your hand. Small group leaders, are there small group leaders here? You should be raising your hand. Uh, outreach leaders or inreach leaders, are there leaders? Women's ministry leaders, men's in the ministry leaders? Yeah. <clears throat> it's sort of unclear who the leaders are, but what we can know is these are church leaders that the Bible was talking about. And the Bible says you should obey, give deference to, give ear to, heed to the instructions of leaders in the church. Now, this is the problem I see in many churches, especially in American churches. The Bible is written in Eastern context. So actually, um, I'm, I'm Korean-American. I'll, I'll speak some things about Korean-Americans. Um, in Korean-American churches, it's very hierarchical. In other words, it's like top-down leadership. Like you have to listen to the pastor. The pastor's voice is like the voice of God kind of thing. And a lot of us who are, you know, 1.5 gen, second gen, we, we, we didn't like that growing up because we grew up in the Western culture in America, the, the land of the free, the land of the brave, the land of equality. You know, who are you to tell me what to do, mom? You know, kind of attitude and thought. And, 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 and somewhere down the road, we lost this understanding and, and of, of honoring leaders, listening to leaders, giving deference and submitting to leaders. And I want to recover a little bit of that today, a little bit of that Eastern, and I would argue not just Eastern, but Christian thought. See, a lot of churches, maybe some of you in this room, you, you come to church, you listen to the message, but there's no real submission to church leadership, you know what I mean? Like, you don't really listen to anybody at the church, like, like you come, you listen to a sermon, but if someone asks you, who's your pastor? You, oh, yeah, he's my pastor. I just go there. You know, he's not really my pastor in the full sense of the word. The shepherd of my soul. The one who God put in my life to guide my life. My small group leader, uh, yeah, I just go and I attend. They give good advice sometimes. You know, I like their snacks. That's why I go. They could be really funny. But they talk too long sometimes. You know, it really annoys me. But, but, but I, I'm just part of the church. They make me go through this. If I want to serve, I have to be a part of a membership course. I have to be, belong to a small group. I just go kind of thing, you know. And so somewhere along the way, like, like I'm sure you've heard this before when people say, you know, I love Jesus. I don't love religion. That's why I don't do organized religion. I don't go to church. Like, I, I, don't, I don't belong to any church. Like, nobody has rule over my life. I'm, I'm an individual. You know, I love Jesus, but my individual way, et cetera, et cetera. And to all of that, I want to say just this, and it's not a biblical word, bullcrap. <clears throat> bullcrap. You are bullcrap. You're full of crap. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I will say that honestly. You're full of crap. Why? Because if you really love Jesus, and if you are a Christian, and you say that my, I, I have a shepherd of my soul in heaven, and he's put his spirit inside of me, then you will love the body, which is his bride which is the people sitting right next to you. And if you love your body and you love the head, then you will obey his word. And the word says very clearly, you obey your leaders. You submit to them. You submit to the deacons, the small group leaders of this church. You submit, give deference to, you listen to, you give heed to, you give respect and honor to the people who are leading the ministry. 
you give respect and honor and you give ear to, you really try to listen to the small group leaders, the deacons, and ultimately the pastor of this church. Why? Because, well, I'll get into the why. But the Bible says, who do you listen to? Who do you submit to? Who do you give deference to in your life? And the Bible says you should submit and obey your leaders. And I do want to pray. I mean, I do want to speak on behalf of Pastor Dave. You should submit to Pastor Dave. If this is your church, you should listen to him. You should honor him and respect him. I'm not coming from a Korean angle or an Asian angle. Please don't, please don't misunderstand. You know, I like, like, you know, Koreans, sometimes when a pastor rolls in, they roll out the red carpet. You know, and it's like he gets a parking spot right in the front of the church, you know, and, and, and he can't eat anywhere outside of, he, he, and everywhere he goes, they pay for him, you know, like, it's like the Korean, you know, Korean church pastors are some of the richest people in Korea. It's like insane. I'm not talking about that. And I'll get into the more spiritual aspects of it later, but, but I want to ask you, you, are you the kind of person who obeys and submits to the leadership of this church? You come here, you are fed. Maybe you've been here for a long time and you've been a part of this church for a long time. But I want to ask you, what, what about your heart? Where's your heart at? Is your heart the kind of heart that gives deference to and submits to the leadership of this church? Or are you the kind of person that gives attitude, doesn't really listen? Just come here, you just sit through the service, you bounce. It says obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey, listen, submit, come under, deference. So that's the first question. Who do we obey? Who do we submit to? Don't just say God. Because if you say God, then obey and submit to your leaders. Amen? So, okay, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, amen. amen. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not your pastor, so I can do this. <laughs> then it goes on. It says this. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now I want to talk about why we submit to our leaders, why we obey our pastors. For they are keeping watch over your souls. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a very rich place. You know, some of y'all are balling. Okay? I don't even know what you do. If you try to explain it to me, I would not understand because my the capacity, I just don't get it. Okay, some, Someone yesterday was talking to me. He works for... Um, uh, Stanley Morgan, yeah, and then he's a he's a um, he's a invest. He he takes people's money and pretty much invests it. And he tried to explain to me what he does. And I was like, I was looking at him. I you know I, no, I'm not not in my head. You know I don't want to look stupid. And in my mind I'm like I have no idea what you're saying right now. <laughs> you know, but but I know he's making a lot of money. Okay, and I know that uh, he keeps climbing this ladder. And he's gonna make a lot of money. And I was preparing for this um, for this message, and I read that part. For you are. For they, the leaders, are keeping watch over your souls. I read that part, and I remembered another verse in the Bible where it says, you can gain the world but lose your soul. You can gain the world and lose your soul. And exactly that was the temptation that the devil threw at Jesus, wasn't it? You can have the world. Just worship me. And what I really fear, a rich place like this, because the Bible says, Jesus said, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to crawl through an eye of a needle. Why did he say that? Why does Satan have the power to offer the world only if he would worship me? Why is it so easy to fall into religious Christian practice? And you go home, you come on church on Sunday, you go home, and all of the values of your life, all the places your money goes, all the ways that you treat your wife and your kids, and all the things that, things that you think are success in this world, why is it so easy to go away from those things? Especially when you're rich. And I want to say to us exactly what the Bible teaches. It is very, very possible, ladies and gentlemen, to be a very, very successful church-going Christian and absolutely lose your soul. Jesus has spoken to many a people during his time here on earth, during his three and a half years of ministry, and I believe throughout history. People come to him and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, did I not do this in your name? No, Lord, did I not do this in your name? And he will look right at your face and he will say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. 
I don't know who you are. Why? Because you gained the world, but your soul was lost. You did not really walk with Jesus. You obeyed Christian rules, maybe. You went to church. You tithed 10%. You did this and that. But in the heart of hearts, walking with Jesus, walking in light of eternity was not your main thing. Was not like you were not in love with him, with Jesus. You just sort of did church. And that's my biggest fear. And when pastors and preachers come up here, and, you know, they don't have flowers here, but if you go to other churches, they put flowers here. And that's sort of, I don't know who started it, but it's a tradition, and it's saying that whenever pastors, yesterday I went to a wedding, they have flowers. Another place they have a lot of flowers is funerals. And that flower is signifying that when a preacher comes up here to preach, he is coming up here to die. This is, this is it for him. It's a coffin. I'm, I don't mean to take away your joy. Okay, Sunday church, we should be happy. Amen? Okay? I, and the word of God, is, it, it gives us like honey, as sweet as honey. Come on, somebody. It's good. Okay? It should fill us with joy. But what I'm saying is this. When a pastor comes up here, do you know what kind of things he has to say to you? All the kind of things that you don't want to hear. All the kind of things that you're like, is he talking to me? Oh, I, I shared something with him three years ago, and I think he's calling me out now. You know, I, like, like. Like, oh my gosh, I shared with him this last week. He's talking about it now. Mm, I'm not going to share anything with him anymore. You know, he's like, whatever. Like, like, do you know, we come up here week by week and we tell you, I know you make lots of money. You've been blessed. Don't love money. Don't love money. And for some of us, like, shut up. Stop telling me what to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to tell you, the pastor up here is concerned about the most important thing in all, in all of this world, which is your soul. Your relationship with Jesus. And I don't mean to do a church world dichotomy. Like the world is no good. Come to church. Do church things. I don't mean that. I mean in every aspect of life. Church, work, family. Is Jesus number one. Is God number one. Is the shepherd and the captain of your soul. Jesus in the center seat of your life. Pastors can come up here and be religious. Pastors can come up here and have dry souls. Pastors can come up here and be sinning in all kinds of avenues and aspects of your life. It's not about where you are, but about whom you love. And when the pastor comes up here, the reason that you need to listen to them is because God has assigned and appointed pastors, like Pastor David, in your life to guard your soul. That's his entire life. He walks with the flower vase in his hands. Why? Because he is saying, I am dead. I will be dead to the eyes of the world. I will be rubbish to the eyes of the world, even to the people whom I lead. Just like the Israelites looked at God and spat in his face and they walked away. A pastor or a leader of a church is willing to say, I'm willing to go through all kinds of pain in order to love these people that they may love Jesus as number one in their life. So it says they are keeping watch over your souls. So Pastor Dave is, has, has a Bible in one hand and flowers in the other hand. Bear me where I am, you know. Has to eat like 15 meals a day sometimes. And he is saying, I'm here to make sure. Make sure, God, use my life. Use my meager, small, you know, he's not very useless. I would say I'm useless, you know. He's got degrees and he's a smart man. I'm use my life to make sure that people of Silicon Valley don't, they think they're in a groove, but they're in a rut of, of pursuing riches, of pursuing comfort, of living a life of pleasure and meaninglessness. Oh, God, use my life in this very difficult place, 2% or less Christian. God, use me in this place, God, to make sure people can love you and know your love and walk in freedom that money doesn't provide, that sex doesn't provide, that pleasure and power doesn't provide. God, use me for this purpose. Leaders are here to watch over your souls. So you should submit to them. You should give deference. You should give ear to what they have to say and what they are seeing in your life. Because he or she is watching over your soul. But it says also here, as those who will have to give an account. Now this is a little scary for me, even as I read this passage. I don't know how many of you guys read the news. I'm sure all of you do. Most of you do, except the college kids. I know... I know many of them don't read the news. Y'all should read the news, okay? Uh, recently, there's been insane explosion of allegation and charges in Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody's read 
over 600 accounts, I believe, maybe it's rising, uh, maybe I'm uh, exaggerating, over 600 accounts of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church over the last 60, 70 years. And you read some of these accounts, it is horrendous. It's chilling. Like, it's, it, it, it blows my mind that, that, that you know, that, that this happened in, in the Catholic Church. And uh, if you keep up with some evangelical news, as maybe some of you have heard uh, the news about Pastor Bill Hybels, who was a great, great, great figure in evangelical Christianity. He sort of started the whole seeker-friendly church movement and his multi-site and his church, Willow Creek in Chicago, is, is a very world-famous church. They run global leadership summits and, and they work with non-Christian leaders all over the world. Very, very, very powerful leader Bill Hybels was. And, and several... I believe about a year ago, allegations against him early in his ministry about sexual misconduct started coming out. And really recently, a woman came out saying, I lived in his house. He abused me sexually, groped me, said, said, said all sorts of things. She left the church, spent the last 30 years just in turmoil because this great man would step up to the pulpit every week, talk about the love of God, the holiness of God, the forgiveness of God, and behind closed doors, you know, spoke the unspeakable things and there's a reason that many of you in this room even in the midst of that news because in my mind in my heart and mind if i'm honest with you guys hearing more of this stuff going on in this world makes me not trust pastors even though i'm a pastor it makes me not trust leaders it makes me not trust myself it makes me really not trust pastors it makes me look at pastors um, especially older single, single men pastors, and I go, why aren't you married yet, bro? You know, like, like uh, to, to be honest, you know, it makes me think, I have, I have a really good uh, a friend who works with children. He's much older, he's in his 40s, and he's not married yet. And he, because he loves working with children, I, although I know he's a good man, stuff, hearing stuff like this makes me go, man, should I, should I distrust him? You know, it, it brings that kind of fear in my life. When I see other leaders in my life, who, who function, because you know, no leader is perfect, I start nitpicking them. I go, oh, he's unhealthy in this way, she's unhealthy in this way. Makes me really distrust leaders. Makes me feel like I have to keep them accountable. You know, the power of democracy. You know, let's all cr go cry, again, all, let all the people join their hands and cry against the tyranny of the pastor or, or the oppressor or whoever this is. You know, we are the justice, let's keep them accountable kind of thing. But when I look to the word, I kind of want to push against that thought today that distrust towards leaders that our culture and the failure of many leaders are breeding. Because ultimately it says this, that the leaders have to give an account, not to you, but to God. Not to you. The leaders are not accountable to you in the same way that you think they're accountable to you. In other words, they exist to serve you. If you don't like them, if they, if they do some wrong against you, get them out of here kind of thing. No. They're not accountable to you in that way. The Bible says that God keeps them accountable. And I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, every sin that a leader commits at the expense of his sheep, Jesus will wring it out of his or her hand. Why? Because I look to John 5, John 10, and you don't have to go, the, the, go there. But it says, in the book of John, chapter 10, it says this. This is describing Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his down, life down for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, Sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. The wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees the, because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Now, just a couple of things. First, it says, Jesus says here that he owns the sheep. In other words, when Jesus looks at all of you, he feels ownership. Why? Because he paid the price to have your life. On that cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the price of redemption to have you. He paid the price to extricate you from the life of sin, of debauchery, of demonic control. He rescued you from your own self by the price of his blood. He paid a price that you cannot pay. And because he paid the price, he looks at all of you and he says, I own them. I'm reading a book right now 
It's, it's, it was written by a man, two men who were in the uh, Navy SEALs. It's called Extreme Ownership. It's a book on leadership. I really like the book. But the, pre the principle, the main principle of that book is about ownership, that leaders have to own up to their mistakes. They have to own up to their people. They have to own up to their mission. And there's nobody in this world who feels more ownership over your life than the person of Jesus. That's why the Bible says that the, this great shepherd, in the face of attack, of sin and destruction in your life, laid down his life. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, oh, and one more thing, and it says that when the wolf comes, the sheep, the shepherd does not flee. And aren't many of you glad, because I'm certainly glad, that when my life was falling apart, when I was in my own mess, that Jesus did not run away, but come running to me to rescue are many of you glad that in your life, in your life as an individual, your life with your family, and life even of this church? Because I, I, I just think about, like, this church. I think about this EM. And many of you are new, but some of you are not. Some of you have been here for years. You, you're, you've been at this church longer than this building has been here. We've been in this building. And aren't you glad about God's faithfulness? Because He is a good shepherd. And he's been shepherding us. He's been guiding us through all sorts of transitions, through pastors leaving in the last several months, new pastor coming, new and EM remerging together. Through it all, through your life when you were disobedient, through your life when your family was breaking apart, through your life when you were sick, through your life when you were depressed, through your life when you, in your life when you were addicted, in your life when you felt no purpose, in your life when you were far from God, the great shepherd did not leave when the wolves came to attack. The great shepherd did not let go of his rod or his staff. He looked at the danger straight in the face. He looked at you and he said, I'm with you wherever you go. I love you. To my death, I will lay my life down for you. I pick it up again, Jesus said. I, gave, I have that authority. He is the Lord, the owner, the good shepherd of your life. Now, if Jesus is this kind of shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep, who says, I ain't no hired hand. I'm not going to run away when danger comes. I am with you. I loved you. I paid for your life with my blood. If that's the kind of shepherd that Jesus is, and if that's the kind of owner that he is, and if that's the kind of God that he is, then what do you think he expects of the men and the women that he sets before you as leaders, as his under shepherds? What do you think he requires of them? Do you think he requires of them any less than to lay their lives down for the sheep? Do you think Jesus will be okay with people who are leaders in your life or leaders of churches all over the world who act as hired hands? He will not. And ladies and gentlemen, that was a long argument, but that is to say this. You can submit to your leaders. You can trust them because Jesus will hold them accountable. The ultimate shepherd of your soul is looking to and fro for a heart that belongs to him among pastors, among leaders. And those people who mess up your life because of their, their bad leadership, because of their lack of self-control, because of their lack of love, even if, they are real, if, even if they are set as pastors. And I know many of you have been hurt by pastors. Pastors aren't perfect. God has grace over pastors too. But I'm saying pastors whose hearts are wrong, who are not for you, who are not living in a humble way before God to love you to the best of their ability, God will hold it accountable from their hands. And so you could submit to pastors. You could submit to your pastor. Why? Because Jesus is your ultimate shepherd. And he, watching over you, has placed certain people in your life to minister to you, to love you, to watch over your soul. Pastor Son always says this. He says, as long as I follow Jesus, he looks at all of us pastors and says, you must follow me. The senior, that's, pastor Son is a senior pastor. And that really impacted me when I first came to this church. I came here with a lot of ideas. I want to do this. I want to do that. I came here with a little bit of a defiant attitude. I don't care what leaders tell me. Pastor Son sat, sat us all down. He looked at all of us in the eye and says, as long as I follow Jesus, you must follow me or you could leave. He really said that. And people left. What I'm saying to you is this. Pastor Son is accountable to Jesus. And because of that, even though he's not perfect, even though he makes mistakes, I choose to follow him. In the same way, Pastor David is not perfect. Far from it. He is a flawed, sinful man, just like many of you. But he is accountable to God in his leadership. So submit. Trust 
the shepherd of your life is shepherding the one he sent to shepherd you. Amen? Amen. That's the second thing. Last thing, and this is finishing. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that will be of no advantage to you. How do you submit to your leaders? And I already touched upon this. And to be honest with you, I'm figuring this out. But it says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that will be of no advantage to you. I'm not asking you to please Pastor David. I'm not asking you to become a yes man. But I'm asking you to really listen, because there's no greater joy than for a pastor to see his sheep or the shepherd, that, the sheep that he's been assigned to grow in the faith, come to love Jesus more, come to overcome their obstacles. There's no greater joy for, for, for pastors to see people going through a hard time and yet cling to Jesus and yet see the power of God flow through them. There's no greater joy for a, a pastor like Pastor David, who, who I know has a lot of dreams, for the church to gather around him and say, you know what, pastor, you don't have to fight us. We want to fight with you. You don't have to fight against us. You don't have to fight us to get us to do something. We want to fight with you. We want to do something great in the Bay Area. We, get, we want to catch a long vision that God has you. As long as you're following Jesus, we will follow you. I'm sorry for my attitude of, of not listening, of, of, of being dismissive of you, of having an attitude of you, of having a biased judgment against you. You know what? I'm sorry. I want to be with you. And there's no greater joy for a pastor, a humble pastor, for, to see a people gather around him and say, man, we, we really, you're not perfect, but we love you. We want to go where God is leading us. We support you. And we will listen to what God has to say to us through you because you have places. place to say. That brings a pastor joy. I, that, at least for me it does. Not the fact that people think of me as great or awesome, oh my gosh, Pastor Brian, but the fact that the people of God are growing, loving God, willing to listen, willing to move, willing to risk something, willing not to be complacent. And ladies and gentlemen, in that way, with that attitude change of heart, I want to call you to do this with joy to, to obey in such a way that brings joy to the pastor and not with groaning. Because to be honest, at the end of the day, that is going to be of no advantage to you. It's so sad to me. I go to some churches years and years down the road and there's no growth. Because the pastor is preaching one thing and the congregation is saying, the pastor doesn't understand us or the pastor is not speaking to me. And the pastor is this, and the pastor is that, and, and the leadership is like this, the leadership doesn't get us, or I'm complacent, etc. It's, like, it's the exact same place, and it's sad. And I know we have a lot of seminars about how leaders need to change, and leaders need to adapt, and leaders need to give up their rights, and leaders need to be humble. But today I stand up here on behalf of your leaders, and I want to say to you, you should be humble. You should adapt. You should lay down your pride. You should lay down what you think a pastor ought to do, do this and that. You do it first. Stop asking of your leaders to change. You change first. Aim to bring the leaders joy in your life. Why? Because it says it will be of great advantage to you. When I see a church humbly say, you know what, this is the man or woman God has given us. They're not perfect, but let's roll. Let's bang. Let's fight. I see such growth. I see a blessing pour forth. Man, the Bible says, receive a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. Receive a righteous man, you get a righteous man's reward. The reason that some of you are not blessed is because you don't receive a pastor in your life. You get no pastor's reward. And I want to challenge you, before I speak to any of the leaders, before I sit them down and say, you need to do this better, you need to understand your people, you need to pray for people, etc., etc. I want to challenge all the people in this church, all the people that God has sent the shepherd here to pastor. You change first. You bring joy to your leaders. How? By submitting to God. By growing. By committing to submission and obedience. Before you ask of them for humility, change, understanding, you do it first. And it will be of such great advantage to you. Because God's word never fails. Amen. Amen. So just a few words of applications and we'll close. College. When you guys go away to church, school, how many of you guys are going away for school? Find a church. Find a pastor. Submit to the leadership there. Students who go away to college, find a church, submit. They are blessed. Some of the greatest friendships I still have are people I made in college, walking with the Lord. Why? Because we all submitted to the leadership and what they believe God was doing. And still, work goes on all over the world. Even some 
So some of the most pagan schools I go to have the strongest Christian fellowships. Wherever you go, I want to charge you. Find a church. Don't just join it. Submit to the leadership. Amen? For those of you, college, amen? amen. For college, those of you who are sticking around, this is your church if you come to this church. If you don't come to this church, find the church. Submit to the church. Don't just hide in a corner. Don't just come in and out. Submit to the leadership when they say to you, their agenda in your life, it will be of great advantage to you. Amen. I, I hear amen from this side, and I need to hear amen from this side. All call, I can see y'all mouth, okay? Say amen. amen. I want to speak to all the members of EM, people who say, I'm a member of this EM. Submit to the leadership here. Especially those of you who fought in your heart, I don't really like the direction of Pastor David. Uh, he's this or that, or I don't really like my small group leader, etc., etc. Before the leaders change, you Submit yourself. Obey. Humble yourself. People who are joining us for the first time, or you don't have a church, or you're floating, or you've come to this church, but you're aloof, you know what I want to say to you? Be, the part, be part of the church. Submit yourself. Even if you're not sure of your faith, say, come up to the pastor and say, I'm not sure of my faith, man. Like, I don't know if I believe in Jesus. Or not. I've, maybe I've come to church all my life. I'm at this place in my, in my life. My wife and I, we fight all the time. But we want to submit to the church here. We want to grow. We want to get the blessing that Jesus has for us. And I know that blessing comes from not you being individualistic like America teaches you. Not you like your career teaches you. You're not your own man. You belong to Jesus. So you know what you're going to say? I, all of you in this church, you're going to say, Pastor David, leadership, we want to submit to you. And if you know what? If you really, really want to cause change, and if you really, really want to say our leadership needs to change, then you know what? Humbly submit yourself to the leadership and become part of that leadership. Don't just complain from the outside. Don't just criticize from the outside. I believe God, and I'll end with this. I believe God wants to do something great through this EM. I really do. Y'all don't know, and, and some of the leaders know, they're getting pressure from all over the church saying, please send us help, please send us help, please send us help. And you know, I'm, I'm a youth pastor, and I really do my best to tell everybody else, look, EM is growing right now. Leave them alone. Okay, I really do my best. Okay? But the fact that the church, the whole church is looking to you for leadership is not an obstacle. I believe it's an opportunity. I really think this group can be a leading force, not only in this church, but in the Bay Area, in your workplaces, in your families. You guys can do wonderful things for the Lord here. But not unless y'all and we together decide to submit to the leadership. Because Jesus is our head. He has sent us people whom he holds accountable. Trusting in Jesus. Let us submit to the leadership that we may get the blessing and the joy and the glorious things that God has in store for us in this church as individuals and as a family. Amen? Amen. Let us pray together. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to reflect on your heart and attitude in your life. If somebody asked you, who's your pastor? What would you say? Are you submitted to that pastor? Have you gone up to say hi to that person before they said hi to you? If you're in trouble, did you cross your arms and pout and expect the pastor to always come to you instead of going to sit them and say, hey, I'm submitted to you, man. I need your help. If you're the type of person you say, I don't have an answer to that. I don't have a pastor. Then you know what? Get one. If you're a part of this church, then Pastor David and EM is your pastor. And your deacons are the deacons that are here. And your small group leader is whoever that person is. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to obey and submit your leaders. Some of you have been serving and maybe you've grown really jaded and tired, you're being overworked, etc., etc. I'm going to ask you to check your heart on where your heart has been. Are you submitted here? Some of you, you close your mouth when you're angry. You don't want to talk about things. You just rather suffer through and bitterness against leadership builds in you. I'm going to ask you to repent from that. And I'm going to ask you to be brave to share. 
Some of you, you have a lot of bitterness and anger towards church leadership, this one and in other places. And I understand, leaders are no, in no way, shape, or form perfect. I want to apologize to you on behalf of bad leadership in your life. But I want to ask you to forgive those pastors, forgive those leaders. Can you move on? Can you forgive? Let God heal you. And say, God, even though I've been hurt, I'm going to obey your scripture. Just like Jesus was hurt on that cross, but you raised from him from the dead. God, would you help me to forgive leaders? And would you help me to freshly submit to what you have in store for me? I believe it's a new season for many of your lives. I believe it's a new season for this church. And if God is calling us to a new season, we need a new attitude. We need a new attitude towards leadership. We need a new attitude of faith. We need a new attitude of what we believe God is doing in our hearts as a community and as individuals. So all over this room right now, um, as, as praise team leads us into worship briefly before, I'm going to ask us to pray. If you're in this room and you have not submitted to the leadership here, you have forgiveness problems towards leadership in this church and other places, if you're not a part of this church and God is saying to you, I want you to be a part of a community. I want you to submit to the leadership I've assigned in your life. I want you to heed the voices of men and women I've placed in your life. I don't care if they're younger than you. I don't care if they're less educated. I don't care if you think you know more than them because according to God's word, you don't. You submit to the leadership. It's not about knowledge for you. It's about leadership. If that's you and your heart has been off in some way, shape, or form, I'm going to ask you to either put your hand on your heart or to open your hands before God and say to God, God, I want my attitude to be right before you. I want to repent. I want to forgive. I want to come before you. God, I will submit to you, your word, to the leaders you put in my life. So if that's you, just all over the room, hands on your hearts, hands open, and let's begin to pray right now.